Hello, welcome to the latest episode in NCQA's webinar series about the future of HEDIS. I'm Andy Reynolds with NCQA. Our focus today is on a special group of digital measures called ECDS measures and new ideas for how to use HEDIS to assess health equity. Now, let me flag for you up front the three most important words you'll hear in today's webinar. HEDIS public comment. A public comment period for HEDIS is open until March 11th. Our speakers will reference public comment. They will encourage you to participate in public comment. That's because public comment is the full, formal, and official way for you to help shape the future of HEDIS. To participate in public comment, just go to ncqa.org slash public comment, or on our homepage, just beneath the photo of the smiling mother and child, you'll see a red button labeled HEDIS public comment. It's open until March 11th. We want to hear from you. If we can go to the next slide, please, I'd like to fill you in on who we're hearing from today, our speakers, and what they'll be talking about. We'll hear first from NCQA's founder and president, Peggy O'Kane. She'll summarize the big why, or why and how are we going about changing HEDIS. Then we'll hear from Executive Vice President, Dr. Michael Ball. He'll fill us in on the six recurring themes or the six principles that pervade the future of HEDIS. Senior healthcare analyst, Fern McCree, will outline new ideas for ECDS measures. And finally, research scientist, Rachel Harrington, will fill us in on ideas on how HEDIS can be used to assess health equity. We will have a Q&A period. And remember, the best way to inform the future of HEDIS is with that public comment period I mentioned. If we can go to the next slide, it's my pleasure to turn things over to NCQA's founder and president, Peggy O'Kane. Thank you, Andy, and welcome. I see we have 1.3 thousand <laughs> participants already on the, on the uh, webinar. So I wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to join us for this. And we look forward to the conversation. Next slide, please. So, you know, HEDIS, we're very proud of what HEDIS has enabled, and that is for us to all keep score on how we're doing on really important aspects of, of healthcare. And even though we're very proud of it, we want to really uh, make it less burdensome and we want to have more synergy between health plan quality improvement and delivery system quality improvement. So, uh, we, you know, we're maybe we're in that middle stage there. We're aspiring butterflies in the future for HEDIS. And um, you're going to help us get there in a way that's um, as painless as possible. Next slide. Next slide. So we want HEDIS to be uh, more useful at the point of care. We know that many people translate HEDIS to, for use at the point of care. Sometimes that's done differently by different translators. And so it creates extra work and waste and can be confusing if you're the person delivering the care. And we want to maintain the integrity of measurement throughout the system. It's one of the things we're really proud of about HEDIS is that we've created a whole system to make sure you can trust the data and that we bench, when we benchmark you against others, you can trust uh, your relative performance as well as your absolute performance. Next, please. And, you know, as we think about digital measurement, we think of a much broader picture of a, a system that's really digitally enabled and that allows people to do the right thing at, at the point of care, not to find out a year later that maybe they missed an opportunity. So we think that when we have a fully digital, uh, digitally enabled delivery system, not partially enabled the way it currently is, that measurement will also flow from what, what people are doing and that they're getting the opportunity to do things right the first time. So, um, we're, we're very excited about this new state that we need to get to. Next slide, please. So the changes will be steady. And um, we know that 
there are there's a lot of variation in the delivery system out there and in uh, the capabilities to use digital data for quality reporting. And so uh, we have to be respectful of those differences. So it'll be a process. It's not a one-time flip. Um, and we will work with you to make sure that uh, we're not uh, putting excessive burden on you as we're trying to get to this new less burdensome future. And we wanna be purposeful and determined to move into the future because we believe it will be much better but we don't want to rush. We want to do it in a deliberate way, keeping our eye on what's happening, keeping our ears open to hear from you about things we may not have anticipated. Next. So again, uh, we've had quite a few webinars lately and we thank you all for coming and for being in dialogue with us. Again, I, we want to remind you about the public comment and um, we do see you as our partners. You're the people that actually cause the quality of care to get better. We're just holding up the mirror. So there'll be more webinars and dialogue to come as we forge into a brighter future. So again, uh, until March 11th, we're all ears. So let us know. Thank you, Peggy. I'll take it from here. Um, I'm Michael Barr, Executive Vice President. If we can go to the next slide. So if, if you were among the thousands of people who have attended our Future of HEDIS webinar series of the past year and a half, what I'm about to show will look somewhat familiar. However, it's been several months since we shared this information. So seeing it again could be a useful refresher. And if you've not seen a Future of HEDIS webinar and would like more detail about anything that I talk about today, you can learn more by watching the previous webinars at the web address shown here, ncqa.org slash the future of HEDIS. Six themes unite this webinar and define the future of HEDIS, and I'll cover each of them briefly and then turn things over to Fern to tell you more about new ideas for one of those topics. Next slide, please. We know people want to use HEDIS measures for purposes other than health plan reporting. Peggy alluded to this in her, in her comments. That's why we have HEDIS allowable adjustments. Allowable adjustments provide the flexibility to modify certain aspects of measures without undermining their clinical integrity. Narrowing a specified age range or focusing on a subpopulation within the specified eligible population are two easy, quick examples. Another would be turning off continuous enrollment requirements if instead of a health plan, you're a delivery system or a practice. Next slide. Licensing and certification. Um, this is simply to provide the accuracy needed to make sure the use and output of NCQA's HEDIS measures reflect the quality of care provided. Very straightforward. Next measure. Next slide. Uh, digital measures. We write digital measures as computer code so you or your vendor don't have to. Using digital measures reduces human error in the coding, implementation time, and non-standardization of the measures. And our measures are downloadable and machine readable from the NCQA store. For those organizations that can download the measures directly into an execution environment, the benefit translates into significant cost savings for programming and reduced time to implementation. Next slide. Electronic clinical data systems or ECDS is NCQA's newest reporting method. As digital measures, these have all the efficiencies that I referenced previously. This reporting method, however, was designed to help increase the efficiency of quality reporting and to use data from many sources, not just electronic health records, to generate quality insights. Now, Fern is going to cover some new ideas for ECDSs um, during her session. And again, these ideas are part of that public comment. The period ends March 11th. Next slide. The next big theme for the future of HEDIS is a shift in our publication schedule. In the past, we released measure specifications in HEDIS volume two halfway through the year in which those specifications were to be used. For example, we released the measures for measurement year 2019 in July of 2019. Last year, we changed all of that. Our new schedule brings you HEDIS specifications sooner than you've ever gotten them in the past. Next slide. This table highlights what I mean. 
Last August, we released the specifications for measures that plans will use this measurement year, 2021. That was a big change. It was the first time that plans had a six month leave over um, before they had to use those measures. You'll see another effect of this schedule change in a few weeks. We used to release volume two technical update in the fall, but on March 31st, we will release the technical update for the measurement year 2021, seven months sooner than the old way. Reporting HEDIS results will still happen in June, same as before. The deadline for submitting HEDIS measurement year 2020 results is June 15th, 2021. Uh, these schedule changes we hope will allow organizations that use HEDIS to have more time to plan their work. Next slide. Finally, telehealth. Telehealth use, as everyone knows, has expanded dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic and provided much needed access to care. Uh, we've added telehealth codes to HEDIS measures and are exploring, exploring how to support and sustain telehealth as a modality for delivering high quality care. We are working to align policies that support telehealth, adapt the quality enterprise to optimize and promote telehealth, and innovate new ways that integrate and enable telehealth. Last fall, last fall the task force on telehealth policy that we co-convened issued recommendations for how we think telehealth should be integrated into a high value healthcare system. In the coming months, NCQA will have news about options for incorporating telehealth into health plan accreditation and patient-centered medical home recognition, but we're gonna talk about that another day. So now I'd like to turn things over to Fern McCree to tell you about ideas we've recommended in public comment about measures that use the ECDS reporting method. Fern, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, again, my name is Fern McCree, and I will be presenting and sharing our updates that we are proposing for the measures that are reported using the ECDS or Electronic Clinical Data Systems Reporting Method. And um, these changes are currently open for public comment. And so we definitely uh, welcome and encourage you to share your feedback and um, share your feedback and input so that your uh, input is uh, captured. So first, I'd like to just start off with, um, we'd like to highlight our vision for the future of quality measurement. Um, NCQA, as Peggy and Michael said, um, we're really embarking on a mission to um, enhance quality measurement, building our specifications to use richer clinical data that's captured in standard formats and expressed using machine readable logic. Um, and we think that using these clinical data sources will allow us to have measures that move beyond visit counts and process metrics instead get to more meaningful patient-specific outcomes. And as programs begin to adopt these measures, we're seeking to harmonize our measures across various programs and uh, levels of accountability. And with implementation of better measures, we hope to get to better accountability and also uh, healthcare quality. So how does the digital measure roadmap fit into all of this? Um, well, we have a few efforts ongoing, uh, focusing on moving towards greater use and sharing of electronic data across providers and systems. So we are creating digital measures as in writing specifications and clinical quality language. We're transitioning our digital measures to FIRE CQL, the FIRE CQL data model. And we're also evaluating measures for the ECDS reporting method. So determining uh, which measures would be well suited for this method, such as new, or existing measures. So let's discuss what are HEDIS digital quality measures or DQMs. Um, DQMs or digital measures are an important part of our strategy to make it easier for plans to calculate the measures and uh, others to measure quality. Um, DQMs are machine readable and written as computer code. They're downloaded directly from NCQA to make it easier to transfer the measures into your systems and they reduce the time and burden associated with interpreting narrative specifications, uh, avoiding recoding and human error. And these DQMs harmonize with industry standards to make it easier to implement across the continuum of care. Uh, we currently have 19 digital measures um, and eight of which are uh, digitized versions of our existing measures reported using traditional methods and then 11 DQMs are specified for the ECDS reporting method. And, and just a reminder, all measures reported using ECDS 
are DQMs, but not all DQMs are ECS. So again, as I mentioned, we are converting our heat as digital measures to FHIR. Uh, so FHIR, which stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, is an HL7 standard for exchanging healthcare information electronically. Um, and we are uh, going through this transition to align quality measurement with other use cases, such as clinical decision support tools, um, and also to align with the direction of other key stakeholders. In last November, we released um, a total of five draft fire CQL measures to provide plans a preview of what HEDIS looks like with fire before we release all 22 fire measures uh, later this year. And these draft measures were intended for uh, information and education only, not to be used for reporting. And later this year, uh, fall of 2021, we'll be releasing the first set of fire CQL measures for measurement year 2022 reporting. Um, so all digital measures will be converted to fire. So we anticipate a total of 22 measures, um, 22 digital me fire measures. And in addition, we also are proposing to digitize three additional measures uh, listed here, the follow-up after ED visit for mental illness, risk of continued opioid use, as well as the childhood immunization status measure. So as I mentioned, a subset of our heated digital measures are specified for the ECDS reporting method, which is a reporting standard that enables a structured method to collect and report electronic clinical data from multiple data sources for heat as quality measurement and for quality improvement. Um, and to count as ECDS, the data must be structured, use standard layouts, meet the technical specification, and also be accessible to the care team upon request. And plans that report ECDS report the measure component by data source. And so we have four data source categories, uh, EHRs, HIEs, and registries, uh, case management systems, as well as administrative files. So 11 measures are currently available for ECDS reporting. Um, there are eight measures that were originally introduced into HEDIS with ECDS reporting. So that includes our immunization measures and our behavioral health suite of measures. And we first introduced ECDS and fajitas with these measures because they do require clinical data not always found in claims. And also we have three existing HEDIS measures that were recently specified for the ECDS reporting method so for the breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, and the follow-up care for children prescribed ADHD medication measures. Plans can report these measures as ECDS alongside their administrative and or hybrid rate. And so this option has provided plans the opportunity to assess their ECDS capabilities with more familiar measures. And this is actually gonna be the focus of our updates today. So before I dive into the updates, I wanted to share that we have been evaluating reporting in the ECDS domain um, and assessing which measures may be well suited for this reporting method. So from engaging with a number of different stakeholders, such as our health plans and states and advisory panels, public comment, um, we have received overall support uh, for ECDS reporting. Um, we've received interest in prioritizing screening and immunization measures uh, and providing an a, a interest in pr providing additional resources or a need for additional resources uh, to support adoption. We also wanted to go into this with a, a, a well-informed case um, at which we shift measures to ECDS. So we conducted a quantitative analysis of ECDS reporting, looking at trends in reporting, uh, trends in performance. And we did see uh, increase, we've seen an increase in the number of plans reporting ECDS, an increase in an improved um, improvement in using other data sources, such as registries or EHR data sources. And also we did observe that plans um, experience challenges exchanging the behavioral health information. And thirdly, um, we looked to improve the uptake of ECDS reporting. Um, so through various learning collaboratives and, and, and adding the ECDS to those three traditional measures, uh, we've been able to gain an insight into uh, the challenges, but also the strategies that can be uh, implemented to improve data collection and data sharing 
and the findings from the dual reported measures were encouraging and, and demonstrated the feasibility of transitioning existing measures to ECDS. So what's next for ECDS reporting? So, so based on these results and, and the feedback that we've received, we are proposing um, updates or two updates uh, for the ECDS reporting strategy, which I'll go over uh, next. So first, uh, again, currently plans, again, can report the three existing measures as ECDS alongside their traditional rates, but we're proposing to transition these measures to ECDS only. And so we've drafted a proposed timeline for removing the traditional reporting within the next couple years for these three measures. And in this timeline, we've outlined two pathways which really depend on uh, how much of this information is standardized for these measures. So for the two measures where the information is well-structured for breast cancer screening and ADHD medications, we're proposing to remove the administrative reporting in measurement year 2023. And then for the colorectal cancer screening measure, where we did see some in, uh, room for improvement uh, for standardization of data, we're proposing a longer time frame uh, to remove the traditional reporting in measurement year 2024. For this measure, we observe that the historical screenings are often unstructured information in the medical record. Uh, so we wanna allow more time for plans to implement strategies to more efficiently access this information. And then between now and then, we have incorporated a uh, interim phase in blue uh, where plants would be able to choose to do either the ECDS or the traditional methods. And we incorporated this um, because we wanted to reduce the burden for plants that may be in fact ready to do ECDS uh, for these measures. And so they wouldn't have to do both, report using both methods. Again, we're seeking feedback on this currently so we can fully understand um, the implications of these options. So again, I encourage you to submit your feedback uh, through public comment, especially. So for the next update, we are proposing to add a voluntary ECDS reporting to additional measures. Um, and so for measurement year 2022, we're proposing two immunization measures as well as the metabolic monitoring for children and adolescents on any psychotics measures. Uh, to recommend allowing optional ECDS reporting alongside traditional. And then also for the cervical cancer screening measure, um, we're proposing to allow ECDS the following year for measurement year 2023. And we did select these measures uh, based on stakeholder feedback and interest to better leverage clinical data sources for preventive care measures. Um, also the information needed to report these measures are well captured and structured data, which is key to report ECDS. Um, and then we just wanted to note, uh, really looking even further ahead, um, we wanna note that we're going to explore um, adding new measures or replacing existing measures with more patient specific measures. So really thinking about how we can develop, develop measures or enhance our measures so that they leverage clinical data captured during the course of care, measures that are capturing information, not just the reporting, but also for coordinating care. And so this is, again, something we would love to get your feedback on, uh, what types of measures would be a good fit uh, for the ECDS reporting standard in the future. So um, we are also continuing to work on methods to improve adoption of ECDS reporting. Uh, we're working on uh, resources, uh, focusing on highlighting the feedback that we have received and also best practices in ECDS reporting. Um, so those are coming soon. Um, also uh, this summer, we will be uh, continuing our quality innovation series, which is an all virtual format like uh, last year. Uh, and so this will be a session highlighting uh, the lessons learned from ECDS reporting. So please visit um, ncqa.org slash QI series slash save the date to sign up and get more updates about that event. And we're also launching the Digital Measurement Community, which is an online platform where you can interact with other stakeholders, um, where you can interact with other stakeholders, share information, share knowledge, share your own unique perspectives. And this is through different podcasts, interviews, blogs, uh, such as the one uh, shown here that was recently posted. So if you uh, haven't yet, please uh, join and sign in and participate in the DMC. 
And lastly, uh, we wanted to note that we are planning our annual uh, Digital Quality Summit, DQS, uh, which is a, a conference designed to foster engagement and collaboration around innovative advances in digital quality. Um, this will be an, a virtual event uh, scheduled from July 13th to July 15th. Um, and this platform or this event will be continues to be a platform to disseminate and learn about the latest knowledge and resources that would be needed to implement these solutions um, that would work at your organization. So uh, please visit digitalqualitysummit.org uh, for uh, more information and, and look out for more information in the coming months um, for this event. And lastly, I just wanted to close again, uh, we really want to emphasize, uh, we, we, we really would love to hear your feedback on these updates. Public comment is open until March 11th. So just to summarize um, um, what updates that we'd like your feedback on, um, the proposed timeline for removing the traditional reporting from these measures specified for ECDS, um, suggestions on measure concepts that would be well suited for future ECDS reporting, and also how can NCQA uh, further support adoption of the ECDS reporting standards. So uh, with that, I'll actually turn it over to Rachel Harrington to discuss our next topic on HEDIS and health equity. Great, thank you so much, Fern. All right, hi everybody, I'm Rachel Harrington. I'm a research scientist here at NCQA and I'll be sharing an update on the efforts we're making to integrate equity into our measures and programs, specifically our proposal out for public comment to introduce race and ethnicity stratifications into our HEDIS measures. Before getting into the details of our public comment proposal, I do wanna take some time to set the stage, review our approach to health equity and summarize where things currently stand. Then I'll dive into the details of our proposal for HEDIS. All of this work is grounded in the fact that equity is really central to NCQA's mission. We exist to improve healthcare, and high quality healthcare is and must be equitable healthcare. The converse is also true inequitable care is and must be treated as low quality care. To start off, I want to introduce how we're thinking about equity and related concepts. And to do that, I'm going to start with some definitions. We frequently see many of these terms used interchangeably, but they're really not. And it's important to recognize this as we think of interventions, accountability, and so on. Health equity is a state in which every person has the opportunity to achieve their full health potential and in which no person is disadvantaged because of social circumstances. We see inequity manifested as health disparities. Disparities are the preventable differences in disease burden or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged individuals and communities. From there, we can think of social determinants of health, the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, the wide set of forces and systems that shape our conditions of daily life, including economic, political, and social policies and systems. Social determinants of health in and of themselves are sort of value neutral. They can be positive or negative, but related to social determinants are social risks and social needs. Social risks are adverse social conditions associated with poor health, such as poverty or social isolation. If you think of income as a social determinant of health, poverty is sort of the negative social risk that comes from that. Social needs are an individual's immediate necessities determined by that person's preferences and priorities. So you can see while all these concepts are related, they do have key differences. And we have to be aware of this in how we shape and frame our approach to addressing inequities. When considering how all of these concepts relate, NCQA is using this as a conceptual framework. We're showing it here to show the relationship uh, around racial and ethnic disparities, but similar, uh, similar framework can be used to think about disparities in sexual orientation and gender identity, disability, and other areas. At the foundation is racism. Racism, racism is both systemic, reflected in structures and institutions, and interpersonal, reflected as explicit bigotry or implicit bias. And both of these facets of racism have direct impact on both our healthcare systems and the social determinants of health outside of the healthcare system. 
For example, if a healthcare provider unfairly gives inferior treatments or withholds quality care from their black patients because of implicit bias or bigotry, then any systemic efforts to make services available to everyone will be thwarted and interrupted. Unfortunately, we know that the way healthcare and social resources are distributed have long been unfair and unjust. And this unjust distribution of healthcare and social determinants lead to racial and ethnic disparities that we see in both the process of healthcare and in health outcomes. In other words, communities of color as a whole face greater social, economic, and geographic barriers to accessing quality healthcare and social resources, preventing them from achieving their best possible health, which is by definition inequity in health and healthcare. So now that I've, we've laid a bit of the foundation, let's review how equity and social determinants are reflected in NCQA's existing work. Starting with our standards, we have requirements across our various evaluation programs. In health plan accreditation, health plans need to assess the characteristics and needs of their member populations, including social determinants of health, and review community resources for integration into program offerings to address member needs. Our multicultural healthcare distinction highlights organizations that are providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services and the work that they do to reduce healthcare disparities. Multicultural healthcare distinction also requires the collection and reporting of descriptive population measures around race, ethnicity, and preferred language. And this distinction really provides the building blocks for organizations to get to know and begin addressing disparities in their populations. We also have requirements for the collection and documentation of social determinants in our patient-centered medical home recognition program. In HEDIS, we have uh, equity reflected in a couple of different ways. Currently, we have two descriptive measures of health plans diversity of membership, one looking at race and ethnicity diversity of membership and one looking at language diversity of membership. These two measures are, are interesting and unique in that they're not just describing the health plan's population, but they're also capturing the completeness of the plan's data and the source of that data. And we'll see how that comes back to inform some of our strategy in a few slides. In addition to that, we have four measures stratified by socioeconomic status specific to the Medicare uh, Advantage product line. And you see those listed here, ranging from diabetes care to cancer screening and our all-cause readmission measure. Finally, in addition to our programs and measures, we continue to build a significant body of research on equity, disparities, and tools to address these issues. This includes a recent resource guide examining how health plans, clinically integrated networks, and clinicians are addressing social determinants of health and unmet social needs among commercially insured populations. We also frequently share policy summaries, case studies, and stakeholder perspectives in our blogs and podcasts. I really do recommend checking um, these out on our webpage. Uh, you can look, for example, at blog.ncqa.org. Um, it's a great place to learn from on the ground experience, the way different plans or states or other stakeholders are really taking action to address these issues. But now let's transition to where we're going with this work. Before we get into the detail of our public comment proposal, I do wanna take a moment to center our HEDIS work in NCQA's larger equity strategy. With the approach that high quality care is equitable care, NCQA is really engaged in an organization-wide effort to bring our commitment to health equity to the forefront of our products, research, and measure strategies. We're approaching equity through our standards and programs, our measures, and how we evaluate performance. Throughout all of this, we intend to engage in research, partnerships, technology, policy, and partnership with stakeholders. All to say, please stay tuned. This is a space that will continue to involve, evolve, and we really look forward to sharing the developments here. In considering how we achieve our equity aims, though, we really believe an important place to start is transparency. You can't intervene on what you can't see. And this is what led us to our proposal to introduce race and ethnicity stratifications into HEDIS. The proposal has a number of parts, including details around acceptable data, data completeness, and measure selection, which I'll be discussing in the coming slides. This proposal is currently out for public comment, and we really do welcome your feedback. 
First, regarding the def definition of our stratification categories, we intend to define race and ethnicity categories according to existing Office of Management and Budget groups. This is also how health plans have re been reporting our diversity of membership measure already. Now, we recognize these categories have limitations and that often at the person level, a more nuanced or detailed approach is important. However, for population level analysis of disparities, we believe alignment with both our existing measure and with a common external standard is very important. Note that this is just how we're capturing race and ethnicity for reporting stratifications. In practice and in a plan or health systems data systems, uh, folks are welcome to capture more nuanced values and just roll them up for reporting. And there is detailed guidance out there, for example, from the Office of the National Coordinator on how to do this. For purposes of reporting, we also propose that the race and ethnicity stratifications are reported separately. So two separate reporting tables. The next question we had to tackle was the challenge of data source. We know one of the biggest challenges to stratification will be access to complete and reliable race and ethnicity data. And these data can be hard to collect and there are open questions around standardizing the collection, ensuring accuracy of data collection and so on. On this slide, we see a snapshot of what that existing race and ethnicity diversity of membership measure can tell us. We're looking at the status of data completeness at the health plan level, specifically the proportion of plans who have race or ethnicity for 80% or more of their members. And there are some trends here I wanna point out. First, ethnicity is generally more likely to be incomplete than race data. Second, Medicare plans tend to have the most complete data followed by Medicaid with commercial plans having the lowest level of data completeness. I can also note that though we're not showing the detail here, very, very few plans have information on their entire population, regardless of product line. Finally, we're only showing one year here, but we've had this measure for eight years. And in those eight years, there's not been any meaningful improvement in data completeness which really makes us think we need to think of ways to help motivate the community to get going here. And one of the first questions we can ask when looking at those trends is where is the data coming from? Why isn't it complete and what options do we have to improve? And when we think about race and ethnicity data for the purposes of measurement, we think in terms of two types of sources, direct and indirect. And these concepts are already in use for reporting of our diversity of membership measure. Direct data is self-reported data. It's member self-identification. It's typically stored in enrollment data or possibly in electronic health records. And it's how the individual identifies themselves. So it's really considered the gold standard for accuracy. However, there's inconsistent collection of this data. There's a lack of standardization in when and how it's captured. And there's also reticence both to ask on the part of healthcare providers and to provide on the part of patients. The alternative to direct data is indirect data. Basically, this is using secondary data sources to impute, assign, or make assumptions about a member's race and ethnicity. The vast majority of these approaches leverage summary data at the geographic area in which the member lives. And indirect methods allow a vast majority of members to have values assigned, which is a boon to completeness, but it's certainly not perfect. It has lower accuracy, almost by definition. Um, it can be impacted by the lag in the geographic data source you're using and also has conceptual challenges. Um, you know, the idea of assigning or assuming something as personal to a, an individual's identity as race and ethnicity has some challenges. And we really need to consider the use case when thinking of whether indirect data is or is not appropriate. Generally, there are recommendations, including guidance from the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academies, to use indirect data when direct data is not available for population level analysis of disparities. However, the use of indirect data is not appropriate for patient level intervention and decision making. Now we know that health plan use of direct versus indirect data varies by product line. Commercial plans, for example, are more likely to use indirect data than Medicaid or Medicare mainly due to some of the, the dynamics around collection of enrollment data and what's available there. Now, all of this and these considerations that I've just laid out have shaped our proposed data strategy for HEDIS stratification. 
we're proposing a phased approach to data requirements over a period of three years. In years one and two, we would allow two paths for reporting, direct data, if a threshold of 80% completeness is met, and indirect data, if that threshold is not met. In year three, measurement year 2024, we would consider requiring plans to report using direct data. This proposal is designed to recognize the realities and limitations of our current environment. Basically, that it's better to have transparency now using indirect data than no transparency while we wait for direct data to improve. However, we're also explicitly allowing plans with good direct data to report using that method starting now. And most importantly, our timeline proposal gives us a path towards requiring direct data for reporting. By year three in measurement year 2024, we propose to require plans have 80% direct data. This strategy was developed to align with recommendations from our measure advisory panels, stakeholder engagement, and in consideration of current state and national policy. And we hope to give uh, plans and vendors time to improve the collection and completeness of their direct self-reported data but it also ensures that we have consistent data for years one and two of stratifications. Um, being prescriptive here really improves the validity and our ability to interpret these results. Go back. So for plans choosing to use indirect data, we also heard very clearly from our stakeholders and advisors that we needed to provide guidance on the acceptable methods. Otherwise, validity and reliability of results would be in question, and we would also be limited in how we could compare results if different plans and entities were using whole sets of different methods. So to that end, we're proposing two options for indirect data, which plans can choose from. The first is the most straightforward, assigning using values directly from the American Community Survey based on census tract characteristics of the member's primary location of residence. The second is more complex, but potentially more robust. It's a statistical imputation method that use bro uses both surname and geographic data to estimate race and ethnicity values. This method is currently used to support existing CMS disparities reports and is well documented both in peer reviewed publications and in statistical code. From our review of the evidence, it appears our approach aligns with other, other initiatives where indirect data is commonly used to fill in gaps for population level analysis. It's used frequently for research purposes. It has growing use for state and federal policy and disparities reports, and is also used in things like local health dashboards. To expand further on the data completeness requirements, we're actually proposing two options out for public comment that we're looking for feedback on. The main difference between these options is the level at which we're requiring complete data. Remember, I, I mentioned that for using direct data for reporting, we were putting a, a sort of threshold or requirement in for health plans. Option one here requires a plan to have 80% complete direct data at the measure level to select the direct data reporting option for that measure. Option two requires a plan to have 80% complete direct data across their entire enrollment to select the direct data reporting option. Now this might seem a little bit uh, overly technical, but there are potential implications here for audit, consistency of interpretation and reporting burden. And so we're really hoping to hear more from stakeholders and public comment about the different implications here. Finally, in all of this, we had to determine which measures we wanted to consider for stratification. Our target is to have five measures stratified in measurement year 2022, which is the volume that's coming out this summer, going up to a minimum of 15 measures in measurement year 2024. And the criteria for selecting our initial measure set was really determined to balance both practical and conceptual considerations and are listed in detail here on this slide. For instance, we excluded measures known to have smaller denominators and some of our more complex risk adjusted measures from this initial pass. In terms of prioritization, we prioritize clinical areas that are policy and public health priorities, as well as ensuring we had representation across different HEDIS measurement domains and product lines. And after applying those criteria, we landed on 10 candidate measures to propose in public comment. 
While our goal is to implement the stratification into five measures, we wanted to give a slightly broader group for public comment to make sure we had backups in case questions arose about one or more measures. So you can see the measures listed here, and they are also listed in full in our public comment materials. You'll see five effectiveness of care measures, including controlling high blood pressure, diabetes care, among others, two access and availability measures, including our prenatal and postpartum care measure, which we believe is highly relevant given known disparities in maternal health outcomes and mortality. And finally, three utilization measures, including our well child measure and mental health utilization. You'll also notice representation across different product lines. So these measures are measures that are reported by commercial Medicaid and Medicare plans in many cases. And I do want to take a moment to review how plans would be reporting measure performance to NCQA. We anticipate there being questions about how race and ethnicity is being used here and what NCQA might do with this data. The main takeaway is NCQA will not be receiving any patient level race and ethnicity data. Plans do collect the data at the patient level, but the reporting elements of HEDIS measures are calculated by health plans in their own systems, including which members fall into the measure denominators, numerators, and so on. Then the plans report this information summarized at the plan level to NCQA. Then at NCQA, we use that data to evaluate performance. So with the implementation of stratification, NCQA would only be evaluating population level variation at the plan level. So among a plan's uh, population with diabetes, did their Hispanic members perform differently or receive a different quality of care than their non-Hispanic members, for example. All right, just to bring us back up to the 5,000 foot level again, because I know we dove into a lot of detail, here are the key elements of our proposal. First, we propose to align the race and ethnicity categories for stratification with existing HEDIS definitions and with the Office of Management and Budget categories. We're providing a path for reporting using both direct and indirect data sources with allowing of allowance for direct data for reporting if an 80% completeness threshold is met with two options for defining completeness that we're uh, asking for feedback on. We're allowing indirect data for reporting using pre-specified methods, and we're proposing a timeline for transition to a direct data requirement. We've also identified 10 measures for potential stratification, targeting five measures in the HEDIS measurement year 2022 volume. So we welcome public comment, which runs until March 11th. I know we've posted the, the link a couple of times already. I just wanna close with a few comments about responsible data use here. We realize that trust needs to be built around the use of race and ethnicity data in general and specifically in healthcare. And to be clear, we believe and in all of this emphasize that race is a social, not a medical construct. We're using these data to better understand and address disparities that are really driven by structural and institutional discrimination and racism. Finally, to reiterate, our proposal for the use of indirect data, so that sort of estimated or assigned data is to support population level transparency. The use of indirect data is not appropriate for patient level intervention. And that's part of the reason we're pushing plans to collect direct self-identification where possible. We really believe that's critical for quality improvement in this area and to help us achieve more equitable health and health care. So with that, I will wrap up my part of the presentation and I believe we'll be opening it up for questions. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you, Peggy, Michael, Fern, for your presentations. Let's plow through as many questions as we can. Fern, I'd like to start with you. Definitional question. What is the difference between ECQMs and DQMs? And I hope you guys can hear me. Um, yes, I, I can answer that question. So um, ECQMs are um, measures that, digital measures that are reported at, uh, at the clinician level. Um, that focus that use EHR data. Um, uh, DQMs are referring to our HEDIS digital measures, our measures that are specified for health plan level reporting, um, are reported using um, both uh, ECDS, the ECDS reporting method, but also the traditional reported, reported re reporting methods as well. So the, really the difference is uh, DQMs are are for the health plan level reporting and ECQ, ECQMs are for clinician level reporting. 
Thanks, Fern. Michael, I'd like to go to you next and I'll pair a couple of questions so that we can be efficient. Um, definitional question again, when we talk about plans, who is that or what is that? Does plans mean payers? Uh, thanks, Annie. Yes, we kind of use multiple terms of plans, but you can include in that category Medicaid state agencies as plans, um, commercial health plans, Medicare. Uh, Peggy's saying no. Uh, the Medicaid plans, uh, Medicaid, commercial plan. Plan, Medicaid plans, uh, commercial plans, and Medicare Advantage plans, uh, if you will. We're, yeah, we're talking about health plans, and payers includes payers like Medicaid and Medicare. So we, that's why we think it's, it's a little clearer to say plans, but maybe we should say health plans. Right, thanks for the question. Michael, I'd like to stick with you another definitional or uh, question about alignment. With regard to the data sets in ECQNs and ECDS, what can you tell us? Are those data sets aligned? Well, ECDS or not ECQNs has been explained. I think the clinical code, if you look at the code language, could be common, but the, um, what's important to understand in, in the measures that we're writing is that we're using national standards um, and that the licensing and, uh, of the measures is sort of, and our copyrights are in the measures, but underlying that the code, the code sets are using FHIR and CQL going forward and the quality data model currently. So that's national, that's not proprietary to NCQA. We're not creating any new standards for our own measures in that regard. Fern, let's go back over to you. Can claims data be considered ECDS? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great, great question. So um, that's a great question because I know we use that term sort of interchangeably, uh, the administrative, uh, that term administrative interchangeably. Um, so we use it to refer to the reporting method. So there's uh, administrative reporting, hybrid reporting, um, and then we also use it to refer to the types of data sources. So there's uh, administrative claims data, EHR, and so forth. And so um, for ECDS does include uh, and does allow the use of administrative claims data along with EHR, registry, and HIE data. Um, so I just wanted to just distinguish uh, between we are in terms of transitioning these, EC these measures to ECDS. Um, we aren't removing uh, the ability to use claims in your reporting. Um, uh, we're just changing the reporting method from administrative or hybrid to uh, the ECDS reporting method. Thanks, Fern. Rachel, I'd like to uh, bring you into the conversation. A uh, viewer asks, with regard to what you talked about, Rachel, where are the data coming from uh, that show proportion of plans with race and ethnicity data at 80% of their members? Is this a survey that NCQA did, or did we get that information from published sources, other sources. Rachel. Thanks, Sandy. That's a great question. So the bar chart that I showed that showed the proportion of plans who either achieved 80% completeness or did not is coming from the HEDIS race and ethnicity diversity of membership measure. This measure isn't required, but it is reported by a large majority of HEDIS reporting health plans. And um, we can see it by you know product line and, and all of that. And that's the one I mentioned where in addition to plans, you know, describing their population, their race and ethnicity sort of distribution, they also have to say the source of the data and the proportion of their members they have the data for. So this is coming directly from sort of HEDIS reporting from HEDIS reporting plans. Rachel, while we have you, another viewer observes that um, he's heard from stakeholders that the imputation algorithms detract from building trust with the communities they're trying to serve. And this is true even at the population level. So what are your thoughts there? Do the imp imputation algorithms detract from building trust? Um, I think that's a very, very important question and comment. Quite honestly, they don't contribute to trust. Um, you know, really, you, you want to have people's own identification. This is, is a very personal issue and it impacts various parts of individuals' lives. That said, I think what we're trying to navigate here is the tension between knowing we really need to get that direct data and improve that and use that wherever possible with the fact that we just don't have enough of it at this point across organizations to get the transparency we need onto outcomes. That's why we're proposing it as a short-term solution to just help get a picture of what's going on, get that transparency started, 
but really pushing organizations to get that direct collection to really help build that trust to, to the questioner's, um, questioner's point. We also encourage, we realize this is gonna be difficult and we encourage organizations to really think about how they're asking for this data and be upfront with their, their members and their patients about what it will be used for and the intent of this um, to really rebuild some of the trust that's been lost with these communities. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Fern, we'll come to you in a moment with a pair of timing questions or questions about when things are gonna happen. First, I'd like to uh, let our audience know that yes, you will be getting both, both the slides you saw today and a recording of this entire event. We'll email both of those links to you uh, in a couple of days once we get the recording. Fern, over to you, timing questions. When will AIS be fully put into HEDIS digitally? And please remind us, what is AIS? <laughs> That's a great question. That is our uh, adult immunization status measure, uh, which is one of our measures that are reported using ECDS. Um, so I'll just say that th um, because it is a measure that is uh, reported using ECDS, it's actually already a digital measure. So um, again, all of our um, ECDS measures are digital measures, but not all digital measures are ECDS. So it is um, already a digital measure um, and, and only is a digital measure. Um, I'll just state um, in terms of, of other measures, in, in terms of um, other measures that, uh, that we presented today, we really would like to get your feedback on that timeline and proposal to move those towards ECDS reporting or moving towards digital only reporting or digital only. Uh, so we definitely, um, these are really target dates. Um, we definitely would love your feedback uh, on, on that proposed pathway. Thanks, Fern. The other uh, clarification I was hoping to get from you with regard to target dates is, is there a target date on the table for CIS, IMA, CCS? Those, <laughs> yes, yes. So I was, that's, what I was, <laughs> that's what I was alluding to, actually. So really, again, this is a proposed timeline. So for... Uh, those three measures, CIS, IMA, and CCS, we're proposing to add um, ECDS reporting to those measures alongside traditional reporting. So right now we don't have a target date uh, or target year or measurement year where we would uh, make them ECDS reporting only. Um, I think what we're planning to do is, is consider the learnings that we've gathered from the, the current dually, dually reported measures and apply them as well as the feedback from stakeholders to determine that timeline for those three measures um, as well. But as of now, we don't have a target date uh, for when uh, those measures would be ECDS only. Great, thanks Fern. Rachel, let's uh, bounce back over to you. Um, a viewer observes that there is more to equity than just race and ethnicity. What about language, immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity? Will equity someday include those other personal characteristics? Yeah, so a really important question. And I would say equity already includes those things. Um, we're evolving our strategy to build those in um, as we can. So we're starting with race and ethnicity just because we know that's such a central issue to the structure of our healthcare system today. But we are evaluating other sort of social risks and social determinants of health, um, both in terms of stratification and in terms of how the heat is volume sort of speaks to these issues. So I would say stay tuned. Um, this is going to continue to evolve this as we move forward. Thanks, Rachel. Michael, a couple of people have uh, written in about measures of oral health. And essentially those questions boil down to, do, does NCQA have or is NCQA planning new measures for oral health? Thanks, Andy. The latter, we are exploring some promising options and I just can say stay tuned. Nothing we can announce right now, but we are on it. So thanks for the question. Michael, while I have you, uh, back to ECQMs, um, a viewer observes that with regard to ECQMs reported by a provider to, to the payer using QRDA, can that be used as a data source? Uh, we're getting a little technical, so I'll give you a simple answer. And if there's something uh, we're happy to follow up, um, the answer is dependent upon how it's reported. Uh, there's a quality reporting data architecture and there are three different levels. Typically clinicians are reporting QRDA three, but health plans would need a QRDA one, which is not a typical way that providers or clinicians report now. And that would have to come from an NCQA certified source. So sorry for the little bit of technical stuff, but happy to answer that. It's possible, not commonly done currently. 
Thanks, Michael. Rachel, I see we're coming up to the bottom of the hour, so let's give you uh, the last word. What ethnicities are being proposed to be collected and are they being reported separately from race, such as white, uh, Latino, and Hispanic, or are they included with race? Yep, so we're proposing to maintain the current structure we use for that race and ethnicity diversity and membership measure, which does um, sort of report race and ethnicity separately. Ethnicity is Hispanic or non-Hispanic. Um, we do realize that some data sources aggregate these values and treat them as, as sort of one race and ethnicity variable. Um, we will provide some instruction. We do um, need that disaggregated for purposes of reporting, um, but there are sort of standards out there for how this should be done and, and managed, but we will um, have reporting of race and ethnicity. Great, thank you, Rachel. Thanks to our other speakers and to you, our audience for joining us. Remember, public comment closes March 11th, and please look in your email in the next few days for a link to both the slides you've seen today and a recording of today's event. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good afternoon.